to introduce all of our panelists, we have the great, the amazing Gabriela Hogg. She is a theology collection manager here at the Museum of Natural Sciences, and I'm honored to say that she is my friend. So, Gabriela, take it away. Okay, that was fantastic, Ugo, and I'm going to call you every morning so you can introduce me that way, because that was just amazing. So I am so excited to have all of you here today. Um, I gathered some friends of mine that are just as excited about collections as I am. As Ugo mentioned, I am the collection manager for our theology collection, our fish collection uh, here at the museum. But I am going to let each of these wonderful women introduce themselves and just tell us like who you are, where you are, what time it is where you are today. Um, and then um, once we're all introduced, we'll go around and talk a little bit more about our collection. So Lisa, take it away. Good morning, everybody. It is 7 a.m. in Los Angeles, California, where I live and work. I am an assistant collections manager in the entomology department at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. Awesome. How about you, Anya? Hi, I'm Anya from Berlin. It's Germany time, so it's four in the afternoon, so coffee time. And I'm working with spiders. Maybe you can see one next to me. I like to um, explain how amazing and beautiful these creatures are. Fantastic. How about you, Violetta? Mm, hi, every everybody. Um, my pleasure to be with you during this edition of Bark Festival and uh, greetings from Poland, from Europe. Here is uh, 4 p.m. and um, here in Poland I work uh, at the Museum and Institute of Zoology, Polish Academy of Sciences um, as spider collection curator. So my every, every day runs into the thousand jars kingdom where are stored spiders from all over the world and of course they are preserved in alcohol so um, that's why they can escape. <laughs> that's awesome and we have um, our museum's very own Megan. Take it away Megan. Hello I'm the collections manager of non-molluscan invertebrates so that's uh, a lot of like crabs and um, other sorts of arthropods, but we don't actually have a ton of bugs. We're not an entomology collection. It's, yeah, it's a lot of crabs and sponges, um, corals, jellyfish, that kind of thing. Pretty much all fluid preserved stuff. That's awesome. So I, I thought we would just kick it off um, talking a little bit about our collections, the size of our collections, and maybe um, where they're from, you know, what kind of uh, geographic coverage the collections have. So Lisa, if you could kick it off for us. Sure, sure. So our collection is the second largest in California. We have about 5.8 million specimens, although I've been saying 5.8 million specimens for years, so the number is higher. Um, <laughs> I mainly focus on collecting insects that are found here in Los Angeles in backyards of community scientists that help us. So that is one of the strengths of our collection is studying uh, urban biodiversity. But our collection is a reflection of all of the curators, collection managers, and other researchers that have worked at the museum over the past 100 years, which is true of all collections, right? So we have um, insects from all over the world. We have a lot of insects from the tropical America, so Central and South America, which is one of the places that our current curator really focused his research on for, for a portion of his career. And our strengths are flies. We actually mainly work on flies. Uh, we also have a lot of Lepidoptera, pardon me, I have a, <laughs> let me put this down. Yeah. We have a lot of Lepidoptera from previous curators. Uh, we have a really strong ant collection as well from a collection manager that focused on ants. And well, I think that about covers it. But yeah, we have insects from all over the world, um, which is true of a lot of collections, of course. That's awesome. How about you, Anya? Um, our museum has more than 30 million specimens, objects, and things. And in my collection are a quarter million of spiders, mites, scorpions, and millipedes, centipedes, so all these famous creatures normally women like like me. 
mostly it's a vet collection, so but we also have tri insects and slides, a lot of slides of very small pieces of spiders or mites. That's so, awesome. How about you, Violetta? Uh, in, in my museum um, are many um, insects and um, this is uh, a most um, part of the collection. Um, uh, around 1 million specimens uh, from all over the world because uh, we had expedition to the tropical areas um, to the um, Indonesia, South America, Africa and this is a big collection. We have also um, vertebrates, uh, fishes and um, reptiles, amphibians of course and um, as I said before, um, we have very interesting collection of spiders, uh, around 2,000, uh, 200,000 um, um, specimens. So um, um, we, we have a different types of, of collection and different uh, persons who manage them. That's great. And Megan? Uh, we have um, about 50,000 lots of stuff and uh, probably about um, like 100,000 specimens, but we are constantly adding to that. One thing that we like to do in our collection is look at the, uh, what we call associates, and that's just anything else that's in the jar, so other species. Um, and I'm a marine person, so I tend to think of the, like, sponges and stuff, but uh, just, like, there can be a bunch of other species in what's cataloged as a sponge lot, so who knows how many specimens, like, species we have <laughs> overall in our collection, and um, a lot of that is crayfish and myriapods, just because historically that's what our um, curators and collection managers have specialized in. I will be bringing in um, bryozoans, moss animals, um, because that's what I study, little colonial creatures. And um, we've also got a number of marine lots that we recently, or we're finishing up a grant for. And um, again, sponges, crabs, um, corals, and jellyfish that sort of thing. And um, the, they're mostly from around the North Carolina, South Carolina, like Southeast United States, but we have some stuff from the Pacific and um, we'll of course be uh, getting some <laughs> stuff for, well, we'll talk about that later, but <laughs> from other parts of the world. Uh, so we're, we're growing continuously. So I have a couple questions for you, Megan. So first, um, what is a lot? And second, what is a myriapod? Uh, so a lot is essentially what a jar is containing, I guess. I might not be <laughs> really good at defining that accurately, but it's, so we have like jars of stuff and the lot is say, um, a crab, and, but there might be more than one crab in there, but it's um, a lot of say five crabs and the species would be, you know, um, Carcinus manus, the blue crab. And then um, myriapods, <laughs> we have lots of lots of myriapods, which are uh, centipedes and millipedes. Oh, fantastic. And I want to go back to something that Lisa mentioned earlier. You mentioned that the collections are a reflection of the collections managers or curators that have been working there. What, what do you mean by that? So um, the vast majority of what of the specimens that you have in a collection were collected by and, and led by the research of the people that work there. There's also the component of people donating to collections. That happens as well, but, but mostly what you see when you go into a collection room is a reflection of the efforts of the research. So the, the curators and anyone that was involved in that collection as a research associate or a collection manager, 
when they went out and they had their particular focus that they studied on, they went to another part of the world or maybe they were collecting locally, locally, excuse me, and they were focusing on a particular group or, uh, you know, a different insects that relate to each other. So, so that's what I meant when I said that. So we had people in the past that mainly studied moths. You have a lot of moths that are in the collection. Right now, we mainly study flies. And so we get a lot of flies that we're bringing in that we're working on in our collection. I think that's really awesome because as you look into collections, not only do they cover this awesome geographic coverage and themselves, the specimen, this awesome and awesome, you know, taxonomic coverage or, you know, how, you know, all the different species, but you also see a history of who was there and what they were working on and where they were working. And so it's, it's kind of neat to see sort of their travels and their research projects too. So there's so much history embedded within a collection, which is, I think, phenomenal um, to look at that. So thanks, thanks for bringing that up and, and clarifying a little bit. Um, so I have, so another question I have for all of you is, what is your favorite thing about working in a collection and what is your not so favorite thing <laughs> about working in a collection and we'll kick it off with you Lisa and we'll do the same round. Okay sure so if you're somebody that loves insects the best thing in the world would be to walk into a room with millions of insects you know even if they're not alive anymore I love being around living things of course but walking into a room I can show you a picture of what one aisle looks like in our collection area. So that's just one aisle. There's 20 of these and you can see all the drawers in that picture. So every single drawer contains hundreds typically of insects because most of them are very, very small. Um, although we do have some drawers that are ones that we use more for outreach and so they'll look more like this Ooh. and it'll just be a collection of kind of big showy shiny things. So imagine that you've loved insects your entire life. You walk into a room full of drawers. There are drawers that I've never looked at, even though I've worked here for many years, because they're just that many. And you pull one out and you see something like this and you just about want to pass out from <laughs> being overwhelmed with emotion. So that's, that's my favorite thing is just being in this sacred space full of organisms that you are absolutely passionate about. Um, least favorite thing, um, well, I think maybe just feeling a little bit of the stress and anxiety of, of wanting to protect something that is what you do for a living right you're you're preserving and you're protecting these organisms you want to collect more but there's only so much space and so much time that you have to to devote to making sure that everything is okay and, and also just where are you going to put everything so it's always that kind of push and pull of you want to go out and really keep the collection growing but at the same time you have to monitor all of these drawers and you where, where are you going to put everything so it's yeah so that that's probably my least favorite part is that a little bit of anxiety that you feel over that yeah how about you Anya your favorite and your least favorite <clears throat> so my absolute favorite is to come into our museum it's a very old building our collection is more than 200 years old and I can work in it so it's amazing and sometimes you have a lot from Darwin by itself or Robert Koch, so famous scientists and you can work with this things, with this specimens. So it's really fantastic. It's history. So and I'm, I'm a part of it. So maybe in 200 years, maybe somebody thinking, woo, this is from Anya. So you never know. So it's exciting to work there. And what I don't like, it's all the dust at my specimens. So to have them clean and in good condition. Sometimes uh, specimens are older than 200 years and you have to handle them. And it's sometimes so hard because all of the dust around you. So yeah, dust, I, I don't like dust. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't either. <laughs> What about you, Violeta, your favorite and least favorite? Yeah, well, my favorite thing is um, cooperation with the others. When we look at the collection, at the spider collection, we, we see only jars, but um, it is not like a graveyard of thousands of spiders because for scientists, this collection is like a paradise. And um, the scientists can give um, to the dead spiders a second life. So 
this is really important to cooperation and uh, not story, uh, storing the material, but the share of them. Mm, because this is a really a second life for and um, destination. And um, well, I don't uh, like um, alcohol because it it uh, it ev uh, evaporates. So um, evaporation and it's very dangerous for um, for material. So uh, maybe you know we cannot keep spiders dry uh, as we do with butterflies or beetles. Uh, look look at this. So I I have um, I have some spiders. Uh, using a pin and their abdomen shrinks and becomes breakable like a crunch chips. Do you like crunch chips? <laughs> and um, well, spiders must be kept in alcohol, in glass tubes, and this is a um, great condition to, um, to, to save for the next decade the material. So I really worry about drying, but um, we try everything and um, what we can do to to um, to, um, to have this um, condition in, in, in good uh, um, Yeah, I worry about that too. All of the fish specimens, for the most part, are all in ethanol. So much worry about evaporation. How about you, Megan, your favorite and least favorite? Um, I would say my favorite is going into where all the collections are and just looking at jars because you always see something new. <laughs> and um, often we go in the back and just are like, I didn't even know we had this. So <laughs> it's sort of a... Um, kind of a discovery process every time you go into the back. If you're, even if you're going for a specific thing, you see something else because all of our stuff um, are in jars just on shelves so you can sort of see everything. And I also like that just collections management in general, for me, it's sort of like not every day is the same because there's, there's a lot of different stuff to be done that needs to get done. Um, and my least favorite thing I'd probably say is, I don't know how delicate some of the specimens are. Uh, <laughs> some of our, I'm sure it's the same with people who are looking after insects and, and spiders, but just like worried about legs falling off <laughs> if you're, you know, just rehousing them or taking photos, that sort of thing. That, that worries me. So I have a question from the chat from uh, Sandy. So I want to be a coleopterist when I grow up. Where should I start? Oh, so that's a great ask. question. That is a phenomenal question because I think so many people have a passion that they don't know what to do with it or that they can actually get paid <laughs> to do what we do, right? So Lisa, you want to start? What should they do if somebody wants to be a coleopterist or or, or a collections manager, or, or get, get, you know, get into specifics like that? Oh, that is a really good question. So I think beetles are a really, really good group to start with. You, you may continue to work on them, um, but they're a really good group to start with because their bodies are pretty tough. They have really thick exoskeletons. So that actually makes them a hardier in terms of preservation. So if you're going out and you're looking for beetles and you are wanting to start practicing doing your own collection, or I should say you are doing your own collection, um, there are lots of really good resources online, especially nowadays. There are YouTube tutorials that show you how to, how to pin, um, that help you to find supplies in your area, uh, what kinds of drawers you want to get and how you want to keep them safe. If you have them in your house, it's a little bit trickier because you don't want to have anything come in and eat your collection, like what happened to my first collection when I was very young, this happened. So all of these sorts of things, it's, it's that, that's a whole class on its own, so I won't go into more detail than that, but there are lots of resources online that will show you how to collect. Beetles, one really easy way to collect beetles is just to use a little cup 
and dig a hole in the ground. You make a little pitfall trap and things will fall in and you can find beetles that way. Um, and then also just start to learn the relationships. Beetles are a really diverse group of animals. They're right now considered the most diverse or most species rich group of animals on the planet. Uh, wasps may, be, may, may outnumber them, but we're not sure. But what I'm saying is there are a lot of different beetles. So you can spend a lot of time just learning the different families and how to recognize them. So that's another good thing to get started on. The younger you are, the sooner you get started on, on learning different species, the better off you're gonna be because it's a very uh, vast field. Entomology, you spend your whole life and you still don't know it all. So I think it's great that you're getting started early and you're gonna have a great time. <laughs> That's awesome. Anya, what do you think that someone should do as far as their studies or maybe after school should, you know, where, where could they go if this is a field that they wanted to get in there into? Um, it's a little bit different here in Europe because the job as collection manager is very new, very young. We normally be um, conservators, something like that or learning something completely different, but study maybe biology or, or museum things or studies. So um, collection management is a very new field here in Europe. I'm one of the senior because I'm doing this now for 10 years, but my other colleagues only for two or three. So it's a very young field. So the most thing is you have been fascinated by these groups. Starting very early, as a children also be fascinating by nature. So it can be plants, it can be beetles. So I'm starting first also with plants. Spiders come along, they sit on plants. <laughs> but first I was fascinating by flowers or something like this. And then you go up with this fascinating and you like to know more knowledge, to have more knowledge. So you can study maybe biology. Now here also in Europe as bachelor and master, before it was diploma, so I had a diploma in biology. It's completely different, so. And then you can start to practice your things, maybe at a museum as a volunteer, a school intern. So you can learn more of these things and say, hello, here I am, I also like to do this. So, and maybe you get connected to other people and have a network, and so maybe it's a starting point for your career. That's great. How about you, Violeta, what do you think? Well, it is a good idea to, in, to start um, uh, if you if you feel that um, this group called um, Beatles are um, you are interested of. But um, um, as Anya said, um, that uh, volunteer is really good way to uh, to have a, um, a wide context of the job, and uh, it is really. Um, Words to meet to meet the people who do it, uh, who do it, who are uh, curators, managers, or uh, biologists or teachers, just you know, um, and um, it is um, uh, go good uh, good way to meet uh, some people who can um, uh, who can help us to discover, explore any any part of knowledge. I think that's great. I think that is so key what you said. Um, what, what all of you have said so far, you know, start making your own collection. Absolutely jump into that. And then I think too, volunteering and interning and meeting the people that are doing it. So even just shadowing somebody to try to figure out what is it that they really do? What, what is, what does a coleopterist do on a daily basis? You know, like what are some of the things they, they handle and, and deal with. Megan, you have anything you want to add to this? Um, I, I think it's mostly been covered. I, I mean, a lot of people don't know that jobs like collections managers are a thing or that um, being a taxonomist, which is what a coleopterist would be, just like studying um, how to identify and name species that like I didn't know that was a, a thing. <laughs> um, when I started, I started with just like general biology and, and went to marine biology and, and sort of took a, a different path. And then collections manager just sort of 
worked out for me and I, I really enjoy it. Um, so yeah, interning, um, volunteering, like if, if you're in North Carolina, NC State is good for, for um, entomology collections is, is my understanding. So that might be a place to start if you want to contact somebody who is an entomologist, perhaps specifically in beetles. Um, but other than that, yeah, I think uh, good advice all around. Mm -hmm. So I have another question on the chat from Tessa. So what do you do as a museum collector? Is your job mainly working to preserve the specimens or do you study them as well? So who wants to answer? I can answer. Uh, I can answer for myself. I think this is going to vary for everybody in the group, uh, even some of the other collection managers uh, where I work. Some of them do focus primarily on preserving the collection database, the sort of day to day nitty gritty of managing a very huge collection. But my job is a little different because I am I do a lot of field work in Los Angeles. So I spend a lot of time acquiring the specimens. So going out and setting up traps that are called uh, malaise traps that just look like a, they look like a tent and they're lighter on top and darker on bottom and insects fly in and they collect in a sample jar. Um, and so I bring those back. I do a lot of identification. I do a lot of prep work. Um, and then I help with publications. I help to write descriptions or identify if we find new species, which we find even in Los Angeles, we found many new species. So there's a lot of different components to what I do under the, my job title. But there are some collection managers that will predominantly focus on just preserving the specimens. I don't mean to say just because that is a huge job. That is a very huge job. So I think it, it really varies. That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> Does anybody wants to add something to, to that? I can what add maybe. Because mm -hmm. we have a very old collection, so the main part is preserve the spe specimens to repair something if there's a leg broken or you lost a leg or to digitization. So make photos, make uh, 3D images. So it takes a lot of time when you handle very, very fragile specimens. And they are very old. And the most important thing is to um, um, cover the, uh, the labels, the handwriting labels, so to bring them into a readable form. So handwriting, maybe it's the same in your country, but in Germany we have an old German language and we have our German now. It's completely different, also the handwriting. And most people, Nova Times, don't, can, also cannot read these old German things the old German handwriting. So one part is to yeah, translate the labels into a readable form and give the information to other people, like scientists or interesting people doing this as a yeah, volunteer or something like this. Mm -hmm. And you have these old handwritten catalogs. Maybe all the others in museums know it. It's really important to have some. Some of our catalogs are around about 150 years old and you have to bring them in a readable form and show them to people. It's history to have this. And old paper, yeah, if you like old books, you know, it can be very hard to work with it. So I have a question for all, all of you. So you have incredible uh, collections and I'm, and I'm pretty sure that you have specimens that they are very, with a high value, like because they are already extinct or it's, it's hard to find. Um, what is the procedure about how to handle those specimens? Because you can find them again. So what is the procedure? What, what do you use? Or you can't touch them at all? Or So who wants to start? Lisa? Oh, sure. I don't mind. Um, well, the specimens that we have, that, that all the specimens are, are, are precious, of course. Um, but we do have some specimens that we keep locked up in addition to having them in a locked room. So they're in a special case and we just 
give extra attention to those. So those would be specimens that are incredibly rare. Like you mentioned, there are some specimens that we have that are um, extinct now. Uh, we also have uh, specimens that were collected as part of a historical survey. So they have a value not just for their, their, their biological importance, but for historical importance. Um, we have specimens that are extremely rare because they're gynandromorphs, meaning they are um, half male, half female. They, their characteristics, they're split down the middle. And so one wing is the you know, colorful male version and the other side of the wing is the female version. So just, just things that are just incredibly rare and we just keep them under extra safe conditions. Um, and, and as you mentioned, would not be, we wouldn't open the drawer and we wouldn't pull them out unless there was a very, very important reason to do so. So just keeping them uh, extra, giving them extra protection is what we do with our collection. I'm curious to hear how other collection managers handle that situation. Yeah. Anya? Um, our very old specimens, um, are in special collection rooms. So it's also not allowed for other people working in our museum to go into this by themselves. It's very, very hard to work with them and it's not easy to handle them. So we often make photos or 3D images if we can and only work with this. So they are in special boxes, in special rooms and it's not allowed to go in. Mm -hmm. Only when you really, really need it. So. If you lost a specimen what's 200 years old, it's, you cannot believe it. What's your feeling when you broke a leg or so? It's horrible. <laughs> so <laughs> don't touch them, make a photo, let them in their box and work with the photo. It's the best way. Okay. Yolita, what about you? Well, our museum uh, is 200 years old now and um, uh, most of this material is historical, so um, now we can't we can't learn the historical material and uh, type species. We can't to share of it by mail, but uh, um, scientists are welcome and uh, they can uh, investigate uh, at play. Um, the historical material is um, uh, stored in special cabinets, uh, metal cabinets, and it is protection of fire and so on. Um, so, of course, uh, some specimens are uh, destroyed without legs, without other features, but it is really um, ve um, valuable um, um, part of our collection still. Mm -hmm. Megan? Yeah, so uh, we have special fireproof cabinets that we keep our special specimens in. Uh, mostly these are type specimens, so they're the specimens that um, taxonomists like describe and name a species from. Uh, so those are very special. The problem with a lot of non-insect invertebrates is that um, there's not a lot of studies done on them. So the, the general stuff in our collection, um, we might not know if it's very rare or endangered because there's just not a ton of work that's done on them, which is unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So Gabriela, do you have any questions? Yeah, sorry, my internet got a little flaky there and I lost everyone's picture. I didn't know where y'all went, <laughs> but now I'm back, which is great. We do have a great question here from the chat. So, so we have someone that's an undergraduate and they're thinking about getting an advanced degree in entomology. Now, do you, any of you have any suggestions? Should they go get a master's and, or should they just straight go into getting a doctorate? And the other thing is, do, does anyone have any recommendations for graduate programs? They're preferring in the US, but any recommendations would be good. So um, let's start off with you, Lisa. What do you think? <sighs> Let me answer the second one first. So okay. I think the best approach to that, there are 
many, many good schools for entomology in the U.S. Um, off the top of my head, uh, Cornell, uh, Davis, Riverside, where I went, um, there are a, a lot of ag schools um, in Texas, Kansas. So there are a lot of different options, but I think the best approach would be to, uh, if you have a group that you're interested in or a particular um, area of study. So maybe you don't have a particular organism or group of organisms you're interested in, but you're really interested in studying uh, pest plant dynamics or uh, biological control, which is using certain types of insects to manage pests, something like that, then you would want to find the school where there are people who are actively doing research on that. And that would be your best determination about where to go. Um, in terms of committing to a full program, Again, I think it depends on what your end goals are. So uh, if you wanted to be a curator, if you wanted to really lead your own research, then I think it would be highly recommended that you get a PhD. Um, but if you want to work doing more assistant type work, which is what I do, I think committing to a full PhD program may not be completely necessary. You know, it also depends on what opportunities are available at the time. So there's a lot of different things to consider. And I think before you would make that decision, um, I think the best way to go would be to find people who are working in the field you're interested in and then really get an idea from them what types of opportunities, job opportunities would be available at those different tiers of, of education. That would be my advice. That's good. Yeah. Anya? Yeah, it's completely different in Europe. So um, yes, you can do a master or a doctorate, but if you like to work as a collection manager, it's not necessary to have a PhD. So a master is enough, I think. So sometimes it's hard if you have a higher degree um, from a university, it's not easy to get a job like a collection manager because your higher degree can maybe be difficult for this, to work with people with a lower level. So you have to check before what would you like to do here in Europe in a museum, only, only a collection manager or to be a real scientist that's yeah, a little bit different here in Europe. So yeah. for a scientist or a curator in a museum, you need a PhD. Uh, Violetta or Megan, do you want to add anything to that or? Well, I think, um, I think that um, uh, are many op um, uh, opportunities to develop. And um, first, um, First issue and base issue is um, uh, what do you want to do? Um, I mean, uh, what is the, um, uh, the subject of your interest? Interest, and w we also do not have any school for curators, for managers of the logical collections. Um, but um, um, the um, the first the question is uh, what is your topic and um, you can learn manage you can learn cure of the collection uh, from the other people you don't have to have university level and um, of course if you want if you need to develop your uh, knowledge it is really good but um, but when you want to to be um, manager or curator, um, I think that um, the most um, most important is uh, look at the other people and learn of of them how to how to um, store the material and so on. That's good. You get you need want to add anything, Megan or? Uh, again, I think most things were covered. Um, I I typically suggest getting your master's first, but that's like if you if you're uncertain of what you want to do, it's nice to go that route. Um, that's what I did, and I stopped at the master's because it it worked out for me. Um, but it's you know a master's is like three ish years and a PhD is like six to eight-ish years. I'm sure that is different based on the program and where you're going, but um, the master's is nice because 
you know, it's, it's not very long. So if you end up not liking what you're doing or want to go a different route, it's not difficult to get that and then change direction. That's good. Yeah. I think the key to all of it is to do your research and start looking around for, um, like Lisa was saying, what, what people are doing, what different professors are working on. And if that's something you're passionate about and interested about and reaching out to those um, professors and the different institutions and what they're working on and just getting a little more information. I think it's key to start researching that in order to find the right fit for you um, in a master's program or a doctorate program, you know, like Megan was saying, if you're not really set, probably starting with a master's would be good. Um, so we, we have someone asking a great question. How old is your oldest specimen? So Lisa, how old is your oldest specimen? Oh, mine is going to be disappointed because I think I have the, the youngest of all of the collections. So our museum is 107 years old, um, which in California is an old museum, but compared to Europe, where <laughs> it's not very old. So we have some specimens that, that predate the museum. Uh, I believe like maybe 130 years old, something like that. So not particularly old compared to uh, the other collections. How about you, Anya? In the spider department, I think our oldest specimen is from 1829. So, but we have much older specimens like 1730 or something like this from the so-called King's collection. So yeah, very old things. That's awesome. How about you, Violeta? Well, I think um, 1850, um, this is the um, lower, um, uh, lower level of the, when um, the spiders were start um, collecting. Megan? Our oldest specimen that we know of are some shrimp from 1855. That's awesome. <laughs> That's cool. Okay, so we had another question. Um, uh, do you kill all of the bugs yourselves that are into these collections, or do you collect them when they're already dead, or how does the collection process happen? So Lisa, what do you think? Uh, I get asked this question on a regular basis, and it's a question that I feel in my heart because when I was a little girl, I always collected things and kept them living. And the thought of making a collection, meaning you you do have to kill the specimens, was was a hard thing for me to 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 do. So to answer your question, we do when we go out and we collect, we do take them and we kill them. We preserve them right away, and there's a reason for that. We don't take that lightly at all. Um, a specimen that sits out, if it if we just let it die of natural causes or if we went around and we collected things that were already dead would be a specimen that would have a lot of damage because there are a lot of insects other insects mainly that would immediately find a dead insect and would start chewing on it that's that's good that's good food so typically when you find something that's already dead there are legs missing it's it's been eaten or it's already you know if it's a butterfly for instance it's already lived its life and the wings are all broken and so, I mean, there, there's still value to that, but the specimen is gonna be in really bad condition. Um, so when we set up something like, a, like that trap that I showed earlier, and there's a, there's a jar attached to it, that jar has uh, ethanol in it, al alcohol basically. And so when the insects fly in, they go into the ethanol and they die pretty quickly. Uh, and this is one thing I often tell people, most insects uh, are gonna be eaten either from the outside in or the inside out. So dying very quickly in ethanol is actually probably a preferable way to go than the way most insects go. So once they're preserved in that ethanol, then we have that specimen, which is incredibly important and valuable. And like I said, we, this is not just walking around and randomly stepping on bugs. We, we, yes, we do kill them, but we do it for a very good reason. So um, that answers the question, hopefully. Yeah, that's good. I think um, uh, sort of a side question to this is, um, and one I would have is, so do you, are you the one that's gone out and collected all the specimens or are these mostly donated um, into the collection or is your collection made up of a lot of collections that came together that were, you know, maybe uh, were orphaned or donated from other institutions? So Anya, how about your collection? Um, 
Yeah, it's a long history. So it's we have so-called private collections. So one give us his own collection, his private collection to us, but former scientists also collect by themselves. My curator and myself or me, we don't collect any living spider. So we only work with the collection. It's enough stuff for 50, 100 years to work with it. So yeah, not, nothing new. We only get do donations or somebody is at a um, trip and bring some spiders with him or her. So yeah, we have enough stuff in our museum, I think for us. <laughs> you have a lot. What about you, Violeta? Well, um, uh, over 100 years ago uh, was tradition, a big expedition to uh, far uh, places in the world. So uh, most of our collection uh, is very old and very valued because it comes from um, very unique habitats. And now um, we, we uh, do not organ organize uh, such a big expedition, but uh, when some scientist uh, is um, retired, so then um, don donates uh, his um, collection to our museum. And this is the main um, way to uh, access um, new uh, specimens. Yeah, how about you, Megan? Sorry, could you repeat the question? <laughs> <laughs> sure. So um, my question was mainly like, do you go out and collect everything that's in your collection or have you taken in other collections or, you know, is your collection a conglomerate? You know, what's it made up of? Yeah. Um, so we, I would say most of our stuff is, it was collected by people in the past. Um, we have a number of marine collections that were orphaned in the past from the Charleston Museum um, Duke Marine Lab and the Institute of Marine Sciences, uh, um, University of North Carolina Institute of Marine Sciences. And that's where we got a lot of our marine specimens. Our myriapods, the centipedes and, and millipedes were collected in the past by a previous curator and most of our crayfish as well were collected in the past by a previous curator. And our current curator um, also studies crayfish. So she um, is adding to that collection. As for me, I, I mean, I try not to add a bunch of stuff as the others have answered. Like, you don't want to preserve things if it's not necessary. Um, but my, the stuff I study are, they're very small, like colonial animals. So you can take just like a portion of the colony and the rest, you know, can be returned to the ocean. So that's nice about them, <laughs> that you don't have to take the whole thing and like kill the whole colony in order to collect it. Um, so yeah. That's good, yeah. Okay, so um, here's a, a sort of a, a, a situational question. So have you ever been working in the collection, working with specimens, and something happened and you were just like, no, I can't believe it just happened. <laughs> so Lisa, you have a story? Yes, I do. Okay, so I work with insects that are really small. So I have a, a pin here. And I don't know if you can even see the head of the pin. Tiny. I don't know if that visual works. Or, or imagine you have a really, uh, you know, a pencil that's been sharpened to a fine point and you just make a dot. Okay, so that's a lot of the specimens I work on are that small. And when I first started, I was still in school and I was learning how to prep very, very tiny wasps. And there's one family of wasps, they are smaller than a millimeter. <laughs> So uh, I think we talked about this earlier. So when you're learning how to prep things like that, you actually learn to just hold your breath the whole time. You don't want to breathe out at all, not even through your nose, because that's like a windstorm for something that small. And fortunately, this, this specimen was not rare, but I was working on it and I breathed out and it was gone. It was gone. And I spent about an hour trying to find this thing. 
which I never found. But yeah, I was pretty devastated. So that was my my big moment. And since then, yes, the whole time I'm prepping anything, even if it's a little bit bigger than that, I just don't breathe while I'm doing it. I'm just used to holding my breath. <laughs> wow. How about you, Anya? Yeah, sometimes when you have older collections, bird spiders are in very small jars. I don't know how they can put it in, but to take them out is, yeah. And sometimes you try to do it as careful as you can, but at least you only have a leg in your hand and the rest is falling down into the jar and you have a little soup of bird spider pieces. So, yeah. Terrible. <laughs> it's terrible, but yeah, if the jar is too small and you try to take it off, and the jar is also an historical jar, it's not nice to destroy them. So you try it, but sometimes you have the soup of little pieces of your specimen. Yeah. <laughs> How about you, Violeta? Uh, I have never had the so bad uh, situation, but I still thinking about it. And the worst thing that could be is a break a jar with the value material. So when you work in the um, kingdom of jars, so uh, you have to be very, very, um, oh, um, I have no word, um, very um, careful. Careful, yes, with the, with the glass. So every day I, I, I'm thinking when will be the first time and first break jar. Oh yeah. How about you, Megan? Ever had an oh no moment? That happens every once in a while. <laughs> I can't think of any one specific incident, um, but every once in a while if I'm photographing a specimen, uh, like a crab and bath of ethanol since you get better photos if they're in the fluid uh, you know it i prefer to take photos of coal specimens with all their legs and claws and everything but every once in a while i'll be moving it and a leg will just fall off <laughs> and i'll just be like no <laughs> that's crazy okay so i remember one time i had a big surprise we were given a donation and there was a bucket. And when I opened the bucket ready to find some fish, since I work with fish, it was just a bucket of blubber. And <laughs> there was a label on the top. And so I had to try to find and see if there was fish inside the blubber, <laughs> which was not a fantastic day. And most of the rest of the staff in the lab, le lab left <laughs> me alone with the blubber. Um, so have you ever had a, a surprise moment when you've either opened a drawer or opened a jar and said, what is this? Like, have you ever had anything like that, Lisa? We had some samples that were sent to us and they were supposed to be sent in, in alcohol. And we don't know what happens, but it's possible that the alcohol was, was taken for maybe for consumption. <laughs> <laughs> so they used water instead. <laughs> These were samples that were sent to us from, I won't go into the details about where they came from or anything like that. Um, but yeah, if you take a bunch of dead bugs and you put them in water and you seal it up and let it sit for a while, <laughs> they rot. And it was like a bacteria bomb in our face when we opened up these samples and smelled a bunch of dead rotting bugs. So that's it. That was one of our craziest moments. That's special. I don't know if they thought like, oh, they won't notice. <laughs> but Special <yeah>. delivery. <laughs> How about you, Anya? Um, I have a much more nicer story. There is one day a visitor came and asked us if we are interested in an insect box full of butterflies. And the insect box is normally 50 centimeters to 40 centimeters. So not so big. And so I think, okay, one insect box, we can take it. And then I uh, meet the, or I met the um, visitor and the insect box was two and a half meter to two meters full of butterflies. 
So the biggest insect box I ever saw. And it's without any label, without any label of any butterfly, but sorted by colors. So the butterflies were sorted by colors. It, it looks amazing, but it was without any knowledge for us. So it's only to show not to work with it. Yeah, more artistic. Yeah. <laughs> This is two and a half meter to two meters, so it's yeah. Not How about you? Normal furniture. Wow. <laughs> How about you, Violetta? I'm sorry, but I didn't understand the question. Oh, so have you ever had a moment in um, when you're working in the collection where you were very surprised? Like, for example, I opened this uh, this uh, bucket and it was full of blubber instead of being full of fish. And, you know, Lisa opened a jar and it was water instead of ethanol or whatever they decided to use. Oh, well, uh, um, um, sometimes um, the uh, alcohol is, has a um, um, very strange uh, smell. And um, uh, when, you, when, you, uh, when you feel the new, the new conditions, so you don't know are the spiders inside or other material or other maybe beetles because the smell is, is not usual for spiders. So sometimes I have some situation and surprises, but um, but it is um, not not dangerous I think for for the healthy. Yeah. How about you, Megan? Um, we don't have so many anymore, but in one of the orphan collections that we received, we would get, um, a few that had, like, mold growing on them, just because the ethanol is what, um, evaporates and the water isn't, so it's interesting picking mold off of a specimen and, and wondering what it's going to look like at the end, <laughs> if it's, if it's going to make it. So you have to be very um, delicate about it. Because I, I had to do this for a sea spider, which are pretty much just legs. <laughs> uh, they're just really long, leggy creatures. And um, it ended up OK. But yeah. <laughs> OK, so do we have time for one more question, Hugo? Yeah, let's do the last question. Okay, do you have one or do you want me to do it? Do it. Okay, so my last question for each of you is what is your favorite specimen in your collection? You want to start, Lisa? Sure, I'll start. Okay, so uh, the Wallace's bee is the largest bee in the world. And up until I think two years ago now, it was believed to be extinct because it's so rarely seen. It lives in a remote island in Southeast Asia. Um, it's associated with living inside a termite mound. So it's just a very, very rare insect. Um, so we have one in our collection that was part of a survey that was done before um, they were rediscovered. So there was a big period of time where we thought they're totally gone and then recently some of them were seen. So that to me, every, every time I see that specimen, I get, I get, I get chills. It's, it's my favorite. It's hard to pick a favorite, but that one's my favorite. That's awesome. How about you, Anya? It's a peacock spider, so it's one of the most colorful but tiny spider, mostly from Australia, and we have one of the type specimens, so it's a specimen that's more than 150 years old. It's really blue looking, but I love this dancing of the peacock spider. The males dance for the females to have babies, so it's very nice to explain it to kids. So watch the videos and you will be so, yeah, smiling. <laughs> That's awesome. How about you, Violetta? Well, um, uh, in my collection are many historical spiders. And when I'm thinking that uh, some of them uh, were collected by famous scientists, so uh, this is for me a very um, special, special material. Not only one specimen, but the old historical materials from this famous and um, uh, known um, scientists. That's great. Megan? 
Um, I have a love for our giant isopods. We have a couple, <laughs> but there's one I tend to bring out when people go through the collections. Hugo knows what I'm talking about. I think it's been on display for bug fest, uh, physical bug fest in the past. Um, yeah, I also really like our velvet worms. Um, they're pretty rare and only found in certain parts of the world. And I just think it's cool that we have a few. That is so yours, Gabriela. What? What about yours? Um, you know, it changes with mine, but for freshwater fish, my favorite is a swamp fish. And it's called, um, it's Latin name, which I love, it's Colagaster cornuta. And I love it um, for many reasons, but one is because it lives in the Blackwater um, River areas of uh, North Carolina. Um, and other states in the southeast. And so it's just really cool to go collect them. And there's still much that's unknown about them. And they also have a bit of a purple color to them, which purple is my favorite color. So <laughs> there's a lot of different things about them that I really, really love. And they are the um, cousin of cave fishes. And so they have small eyes. Um, so anyways, they're just a really, really cool fish. So if you get a chance, look up swamp fish because they're they're really, really cool. But I think, oh, I think we're out of time, um, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, so I just want to thank Lisa and Anya, Violeta and Megan for coming and being here today. And for everyone that um, joined us today and had some great questions on the chat. I love talking about collections <laughs> and I know these women love to do it too. So we, we're so excited everyone joined us today. And um, thank you from joining, for joining from all over the world <laughs> and at different time zones. Um, so yeah, Ugo, did you wanna say anything else? Yeah, so again, thank you to all our panelists. This was great and I'm sad that we couldn't ask more questions because that we didn't have time, but I hope that we can do this again in another time. And thank you, um, Gabriela, just to lead all, all this. And let me share with you a screen because today is the last day of Backfest, but we still have a lot of programs. So check backfest.org for, for the rest of the programs. And of course, what is a Backfest? without a Backfest shirt. <laughs> so go to backfest.org to get yours, or if you join or renew your museum membership, you can get one for free. So again, thank you to our sponsors, uh, Terminix and BASF. And good news, so the museum is resuming on-site operations this Tuesday, the 22nd. So get your free ticket at naturalsciences.org. And again, I hope to see you on another program and have a wonderful evening. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.